because that shame is a constant, common part of relating. It's the way that we're bonding, or the way when we bond, it includes linking the shame to the bond. I'm Alan Robarge, an attachment-focused psychotherapist and a relationship educator, and I like to talk about how to heal attachment trauma and improve our relationships. And on this video, let's answer the question, what is bonding through shame? Let's explore specifically what that means and also name concrete action steps that you can apply to your self-directed healing work. Now, for my work with clients over the years, I've been developing and promoting a model of self-directed healing. And at its core, it's about three things, listening to self-wisdom, leading with self-action, and choosing self-compassion. All of these three things combined equals loving yourself. So for today, we wanna apply this model of self-directed healing work to our question, what is bonding through shame? Let me share with you the structure of this video. I like to organize uh, the content so that it covers three areas. We have the what, we have the how it works, and then we have the process or healing process. Now, the format of this uh, video is Q&A, question and answer. However, I like to call it Q&R, and the R stands for reflection. My intention is to spark self-inflection. How this works is I take questions from the online community called Improve Your Relationships, then we brainstorm and explore possibilities. We consider the many different angles for answering a question. We're not looking for just one specific right answer. Instead, we wanna come up with possibilities. So that being said, let's jump in. Let's, let's tackle this question. What is bonding through shame? It is a challenging question. And this video potentially is going to be a bit layered or complex. And I say that almost in a way to give myself a pep talk to be able to cover the range of what I wanna share here. I really consider the content here, this topic is one of the most important things to talk about. And it's a reoccurring theme that comes up in my work with clients on a regular basis. So let's acknowledge when I'm talking about shame, I'm not just talking about your shame or my shame. I'm talking about our shame. Let's put it in the context of a family system or being in relationship to a parent. It's not just the child's shame. It's the shared experience between both people. So it's our shame. And what I want to focus on is how the shame gets folded into the relating. It's simultaneously present when we have love and connection and intimacy and openness and simultaneously shame is woven into all of those experiences. An example that I like to give that comes up uh, frequently has to do with using pesticides on fruit trees or it could be in the garden and you know on anything that that we eat and then we wash the you know let's say it's an apple we wash the apple or if we're picking something out of the garden we want to wash off any other you know chemicals or pesticides that is somewhat of a futile and not very how it's a bit symbolic i mean we could do it symbolically to think that it's cleaning the, the fruit and we're getting something on the outside off of it. But the truth is, is that if pesticide has been sprayed on this apple for the duration of its life while it's been growing on the tree, the pesticide has grown into the apple itself. It's not just able to, to stay outside on, on the skin of the apple. 
So we're not really washing it off. It's, it's a part of the same, it's part of um, the whole apple includes a component, an aspect of that apple is the ingredients, the environment, the, the elements, not so much the ingredients, but the, all the elements go into making up that apple. So this is true of shame. If there, if there was shaming behavior in a family or shame is present or the way that the child starts to think about the disconnect, the non-relating, the frustration of not really being seen, known, heard, valued, appreciated, understood, and then the responses to blame oneself and to think, well, there must be something wrong with me and, and I must not be valued. I don't matter. I'm not good enough. And this is, this is stoking an experience of shame. And so while we're continually relating to the parent, we're also simultaneously experiencing shame. Now that example I just gave was very much about our own internal process. There's also, if we think of families, we think of the relationship between a parent and a child, we can, we can think of it in terms of a system and that there are these energies or these uh, behaviors, these qualities of mind that are participating in the family culture, that's participating in this system. And if a parent is neglectful in some way, emotionally neglectful, if the parent is has ice, uh, um, supports keeping the child isolated emotionally, and the parent, parent could have very good reasons for the distraction, very good reasons for not being able to fully uh, stay in direct relationship with the child. Uh, it's what I call there, not there. Uh, it's relating that's not really relating. We uh, have the, the construct or the semblance of being in relationship, but there's no real meaningful exchange, presence, emotional attunement that, that's occurring. And if the parent is unable over time, now we want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. We want to come from a place of gentleness and kindness and really support that we're not here to belittle the parent for falling short. However, it's a reality that happens in many families. And if the parent is unable to realize that their emotional availability is falling short and they're not actually showing up in direct relationship to the child, we can say that over time, now there's shame in the family system because that behavior is shameful. And now we have shame floating in the family system and the child is going to soak that in, take that on as his or her own, as their own, and over time, the way that the parent and the child are relating incorporates, includes uh, an aspect of shame. The shame is now folded into the kind of relating that we're doing. Because this topic is so rich and so much, I have a, a whole series of notes here and I wanna check my notes to make sure that I'm connecting uh, all the dots. So I'm talking about bonding through the wound, relating through the wound, linking the dysfunction of our relation, uh, of linking a dysfunctional way of relating to our relationship. Now let me use a bit of an extreme or obvious um, example that gives us more of a black and white framework and then we're going to transition away from that more concrete example and again return to looking at more of this um, behavioral aspect of shame or this feeling state of shame. The more black and white example would be if there's uh, some kind of physical abuse happening in a family 
and the child still cares about the parent. The child loves the parent. The child needs, is dependent on the parent for their well-being. So the child is simultaneously investing in building relationship with the parent. However, every so often, there happens to be also physical abuse occurring in the home. And so in those times, relating to the parent is not safe and uh, it undermines trust and it creates a, 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 a fracture, a disconnect in the relating. But you see those two things are simultaneously happening. We have the connection, the love, the you know, a child wants to feel close to a parent. A child wants to have a, 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 a relationship with the parent and uh, experience healthy dependency. And if there happens to be this additional layer of the physical abuse, those two things are getting intertwined. They're, they're enmeshing. So let's take that same idea of this ability for these things to enmesh. And now we're, we're not looking at uh, physical abuse. We're looking at there's behaviors that are occurring that are creating an environment of shame. The child is taking that in and it is now shaming uh, their self. Them sh the, 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 the child starts to be to shame themselves. And the way that the child maintains, here's the clincher, here's why the whole, this video is so important to me. The way the child maintains a relationship to the parent is to keep the shame alive because the shame becomes the language or the vehicle or the glue, the way that we stay connected. So I'm going to say that one again. I mean, this stuff is so layered and complex, but please stay with me here. This one, this is most important for our healing work because many of us get into a double bind and we get stuck here. When there's shame present, it could be being shamed in the sense of the parent is belittling. It could be that due to the lack of connection, the child starting to blame themselves and there's a quality of, well, I my parent is not reaching out to me because I don't matter. There's something fundamentally wrong with me. I'm lacking. I'm broken. My parent doesn't like me. I'm not good enough. So it works sort of both ways. It could, you know, it can be very much directly the, the parent's behavior and something the parent is or isn't doing. It's also how the child's interpreting the very painful disconnect of not having a more active, emotionally attuned, connected relationship with the parent. And so then the child's response is to start shaming themselves to manage the grief and the pain of what it's like to not be close to that parent. And over time, because that shame is a constant common part of relating, it's the way that we're bonding or the way when we bond, it includes linking the shame to the bond. And therefore, if we want to continue to stay in relationship, if the parent and the child want to continue to stay in relationship, they are going to keep their common language, their common approach, the, the, the common way that they exchange connection is going to have to stay in place. So we're no longer just connecting through caring. caring. We're no longer just connecting through intimacy or vulnerability or emotional openness. We are also simultaneously building relationship through our shared shame. So here's why this is so painful. Our minds have the ability to bridge the gap of disconnect in our relationship. Let me explain what that means. When I am in physical present moment proximity 
with a parent, with a loved one, with a friend, whoever it is, we're in relationship. We're, we're literally, physically with each other and we are engaging and we're talking and we are experiencing, you know, we're going on a, on a picnic, we're going bike riding, we're watching a movie together, we're living life. And the relationship is occurring in those shared moments of real world, present moment interaction. However, what happens when the movie's over? What happens when the picnic's over? When we're not going bike riding? We have lives outside of being together all the time. And we separate. Now, when we separate, does the relationship end? No, of course not. We know that the relationship continues because we carry the person inside of us. And we, we can refer to this in psychological terms as there's this introject. We, we, we internalize the introject of the parent or the uh, introject of the other person that we're in relationship with. And we're even gonna change the language. It doesn't even have to be specifically the other person. It's just the relationship itself. Imagine there's me, there's the other person, and then there's this shared space between us, and that's the we, the, the we part. And, and we integrate that into our whole, you know, our sense of orienting to the world. And that if we're not in physical proximity, if we're not hanging out together, um, I'm doing my thing, they're doing their thing, and yet we are still in relationship because we rely on our this function of our brain to bridge the gap of when we're not connected, but we can still pull from, I'm loved, I'm in relationship, this person cares about me, I can activate the feeling of being cared for, I can activate knowing I'm in this relationship, through my own inner world experience of this introject. Now, isn't this genius? I mean, this is a real, uh, an incredible function. And just from an evolutionary standpoint, it means that we don't always have to be together, uh, you know, near each other all the time in order to um, benefit from feeling connected and to benefit from the relational bonds that we've created. I mean, this is really helpful stuff. And so what I'm pointing out is saying, well, this is the mechanism of how the brain works and say, well, that's helpful. However, there's a flip side to this. What happens when the introject that we are, are, are internalizing is not based on the goodness of emotional presence and attunement and responsiveness and warmth and love and caring and kindness and openness, what if that introject either includes, or for the sake of my point in this moment, I'm just gonna say even in an extreme sense, what if it's mostly an introject of shame? So the way that I can bridge the gap and stay connected to the parent that I care about, the way I can bridge the gap and stay in relationship to the person I care about is by activating this shame. And I take it with me. And I know that I, and this is, this is the part I call this inverted relating because it's going to not make sense. It's, it's really sort of turns the whole thing upside down on its head. But what it means is that I feel close, I feel loved, I feel I'm in relationship if the shame is activated. I don't know if you're feeling this in this moment. I mean, this is really painful, outrageously painful stuff. And you realize, you know, I can see the timer on the video here. We're at 21 minutes. It's taken me 21 minutes to get to this. And also keep in mind, I've been working on trying to, you know, be able to communicate these ideas for, you know, the last 18 years. So it really takes a lot to be able to map out what is going on here. So I've internalized the interject of our relationship 
And a component of our relating is based on an exchange of shame. So I've internalized shame and the way that I stay in relationship with you, the way that I can feel that I'm still in relationship with you, the way that I can still feel loved by you is by using the shame that we share between us. So I develop an allegiance. I develop a loyalty. I develop an attachment to my shame. It's what I call loving the shame. So we love it. I'm not giving this up. Why? Think about this. And again, this is really why I'm making the video here. This is so important and so painful. Why wouldn't we give this up? Because it's intertwined and linked with the person that we care about, especially if it's a parent. Our whole brain, our being, is hardwired to make sure we stay connected to a parent. There's the psychic archetypal, the archetype of the parent as a, um, allowing us to stay grounded in the order of things and how things are supposed to be and that a parent provides um, a, an orientation to life that things are okay and that I'm going to be okay as long as I stay connected to my parent. And it really helps give us um, stability and uh, um, um, uh, safety and a sense of belonging. Even if our, our literal relating, our, our, our actual relationship is rocky or unsatisfying or disappointing or hurtful, it's still that hardwired, um, deep knowing that if we have a parent in our life in some capacity, that it helps us feel a sense of things are okay. So if we are going to challenge that, if, if we are going to try to undo that foundational, deeply driven purpose for how we orient, it is going to take a lot of psychic energy to override that very um, primordial need to stay in connection with the parent. But this is the crossroads. This is why this video is important and why this healing work is really hard. If I want to confront the shame that I've internalized and I want to stop shaming myself and participating in the exchange of shame with a parent or another family member or we we take the same thing I'm talking about and these are the type of relationships that we create in our adult life and we're trying to we're trying to um, almost recruit through trauma reenactment we're we're almost trying to recruit someone to join us in the same kind of dynamic and to say, will you love me through the shame? Will you know me through the shame? Will you relate to me through this trauma? And that this is what is meant by the word trauma bond and trauma bonding. And I took time in this moment before just going directly to that word, that phrase trauma bonding, because it can be off-putting, it can be a bit extreme or hard to make sense of. But in fact, many of us are in these type of trauma-bonded relationships and we don't necessarily mean incident-specific extreme trauma such as um, um, a cert certain levels of abuse um, or certain levels of manipulation or um, um, mean-spirited behaviors of, of really being hurtful. Now, of course, many of us fall into that category as well. Many of you watching this video also have that history as well, which quite honestly, I think makes, makes all understanding this even more complicated because it, it just creates another layer. 
But in this moment, I'm not so much, when I think of trauma bonding, I'm not, point, I'm not thinking of that there was an incident specific trauma and or ongoing chronic abuse, and now we're bonding through the abuse. And again, that, that's very much what, what is in, means by that phrase. But I'm also borrowing this idea or I'm applying, I'm, I'm going to apply how this function of trauma bonding works to saying the, the, the trauma is living in a chronic state of shared shame. And that shows up as our wound. And we continually stay connected to the parent through the wound. It's how we stay linked. It's how we stay bonded. We know each other through the wound. So you do healing work. You get to a certain place. You uncover the layers. You work with the grief. You drop into not only what happened, but also what didn't happen. And you get to a point where you realize, I don't want to relate on this level of shame. I don't want this to be a strong leading aspect of how we're in relationship. So I want to shift this. I don't want to know you through shame. I don't want to use the language of shame. I don't want to keep shame activated in my psyche as a way that I relate to you and keep the interject internally internally centered uh, at, I don't know the word here, how I keep that shame at the forefront of how we're relating. I want to, I want to move it aside. Here's the challenge. The double bind in our mind, double bind meaning um, you're in a, between a rock and a hard place. Uh, both options are unattractive. Uh, it's the phrase, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And so if we want to move away and say goodbye to our shame. The way that it is coded in our brain is that it's gonna be the same as saying, saying goodbye to the parent. And do you see the setup, like why we can't do that? We very much don't wanna stay in a relationship through the shame, and we do not want shame activated in our own life. We don't want to take this interject and keep carrying it with us even when we're not in proximity or literally with the parent or with the other, again, it could be partner relationship, could be family, whoever. But if we know that we have to, that we want to get rid, well, it's so hard to say get rid of because it, it's, it, that's too extreme. If we want to developmentally grow through, move beyond, no longer invest in shame and over time change this habit, change the habituated response. We, it gets set up in our psyche that, that we have to choose that if we say goodbye to the shame, we're simultaneously saying goodbye to the only relationship that we know with that parent. Who can do that? Who can, who can really consciously, purposefully, I mean, s some of us can do it. Some of us have done it. Um, those, those of perhaps again, you watching the, those of you who have such um, obvious abuse and hurt and traumatic experiences that it becomes so clear to, to say, I do not want this person in my life. Yes, I love them or love the idea of them or yes, I don't love them and yet they're my parent. And I really need to create a real strong boundary and I need to sever ties, I need to move on, I can't be in relationship with them. Most of us don't have such a clear cut extreme ability to make that happen because we still have other aspects of maintaining a connection to the goodness of the parent. We still love the parent. And there are many 
qualities that the parent has has tried their best has is a is a kind person is a trusting person and again i'm making a lot of assumptions here you, you got to sift through what i'm saying it might or might not apply to you but what i'm pointing out is that when we reach this awareness that if i'm going to really say goodbye to the shame that stays alive inside of me it is experienced and coded into my brain intertwined with my relationship with my parent. So if I'm saying goodbye to the shame, I have to say goodbye to the parent. Now, this doesn't mean literally, it doesn't mean literally stop having being in relationship with the parent, but psychically, internally in my mind, that's how it's gonna feel. And that is going to activate and trigger this extreme survival response because no one in their right mind, no child, when you tap into your child self, no child is going to say, hey, I have the wherewithal to totally walk away from the parent and be on my own. Because again, we are hardwired to say, I need this parent to help me to survive. And I need this parent to feel some sense of belonging and connection and safety in this world. And our healing work prepares us or our, our healing work takes us down the path that we, we don't, don't quite realize that we're going down the path where there's going to be this real confrontation, this internal psychic confrontation. And that's the point of this video. When you reach this place of this internal psychic confrontation and you say, wow, I cannot live in this state of shame animating my experience and using shame as a common language to relate to my parent or my family member or my significant other, whoever it is. And in order to let go of that shame, I'm also actually letting go of the relationship. And then we, and then it just, I don't know if you could feel it in that moment. I feel we drop in, it's this heavy, 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 burdened grief of, wow, I've spent the majority of my life using this template of trauma bonding. And in this, in this moment, I'm going to say using this template of shame bonding. It's, it's the main operating system for how I'm in relationship with my parent. It's the main operating system for how I'm in relationship in my significant other partner relationships. And to give that up because it's the primary way that I relate, it, it feels like a kind of death. It's a grief that's so heavy and burdened because we have yet to experience or feel the alternative of relating to the parent without this kind of shame being present. And what we're perceiving is that it's a very stark choice where both options are not attractive. Stay doing the same thing, which means continually having the shame be a part of how we're relating, or say goodbye to the shame and say goodbye to the main way that we stay connected to the parent. And to say goodbye to the shame is to say, well, I'm, I guess I'm not going to be connected to you anymore. Painful, painful stuff. Let's talk about coming into our healing work as next steps of, of what we're, how we begin to map out a plan to make this a little more workable. And again, as I said before, I have some notes here. And I think I'm going to just flip through my notes and make sure that I got a couple things. So, I don't know if you're feeling, there's a profound grief and that's, that's uh, bullet point number one for healing work is, um, healing work is grief work, grief work is healing work. And we show up like we're doing right now in this moment to 
contemplate, to have a visceral, embodied um, felt experience of the grief. And it's not just an idea. We're not just talking about ideas. As we work through the layers, it activates our sadness. It activates our missed opportunities. It activates our regrets. Sometimes that shows up in the form of stories and very specific imagery and memories. Other times it's more of a feeling state. Sometimes it shows up in our body as sensations. We make commitment to stay focused on this grief work. And as I said earlier, we're not only grieving what happened, but we're grieving also what didn't happen. The next piece of the puzzle that I think is so important, and this is actually a, a message of hope, is that everything up until now, I, I framed it as, you know, our brain is perceiving that we're giving up the parent-child relationship. And for the sake of the point that I'm making here, I'm saying, yeah, we are. We're, we're saying like, I can't do this anymore. I do not want this particular dynamic that we've created. And um, forgive me, this is the third time I'm saying it because I, I just want to acknowledge, I mean, I'm really honing in on the parent-child relationship, but these are the kind of relationships that we create in our adult life as well. So th this very much applies to our, uh, with our spouse and our, our romantic partner relationships. But in the example with the parent, and if, if we're saying, really saying goodbye to parent-child relating, the hope, the, the invitation, or the place also that you can approach with a kind of freshness is to say, well, we need to learn adult to adult relating and that we are not going to see our parent as a parent, and we are not going to keep trying to get the parent to be the parent that they never were, and we're also not going to keep ourselves in a child state of mind, waiting for the parent to finally be able to connect to us in the way that we need, and we have so much evidence and so many years and so much life experience that just says, that is not going to happen. So we start to change our framework of saying, if I bring this parent-child relationship to an end, and if I bring the way that we're relating, particularly with the aspect of active shame and exchange of shame being part of the relationship, if I want to close that down, the, the hope the, the new way of relating that can enter is what we would call adult to adult relating. And it does require a shift internally. It does require seeing the parent as an individual adult and not as the parent. And seeing yourself as an individual adult and not as the child who needs the parent. And these relationships, when we enter adult to adult relating, we might also still find out that the parent doesn't have the skills or does not value dropping down into the depth of emotional exchange and connection that you desire so much and that you want. And the reason why the parent-child relationship didn't work in the original sense was because there was not that level of depth of emotional connecting. So we can be honest with ourselves and do reality testing and say, well, chances are it's also not going to happen in the adult to adult exchange. However, we also have put an ending or uh, we have brought to a close the deep longing to stay in the parent-child exchange waiting for something that's not going to be delivered. Now you also might conclude, and this is another layer of grief, that you don't want to be an adult to adult relating with your parent. And if you're saying goodbye to this keeping shame alive in the exchange of how you're connecting, that you're actually realizing, well, I'm not even, I don't think I'm gonna have a relationship with this person at all. And then we move into more grief work and we have a funeral. We mourn 
uh, what is not possible. And we hopefully can connect to the goodness of the parent or their humanity or know that they too uh, have been hurt and their history and the lineage of intergenerational attachment trauma has carried them up to this point. And the reason why you both are experiencing the great disconnect is because it's, you're, you're both on the receiving end of that intergenerational trauma. And so you might not have an active adult to adult relationship, but you can have an active relationship with the compassion. You're substituting, you're changing, you're shifting from a framework of shame into a framework of compassion. And it's not going to be the kind of immediate relationship where you're hanging out, talking on the phone, seeing each other, going for a picnic, going grocery shopping together. It might be a, a very removed relationship. But when, back to the interject, we were creating a new internalized sense of, of the we, the we that we have inside of us now. And that's going to be based on compassion and a kindness for all of our shortcomings and what, and, and what didn't happen for us and yet we can extend compassion and kindness to the parent. And it might be something that we do more internally because we're not actively in relationship anymore. And that is something that you have to decide. And if you come into the clarity of that decision, that is so hard, that is so painful. So empathy to you, empathy to all of us who grapple with trying to figure out how to create this transition from the parent-child relating into adult to adult relating. We also need to, and I've, I've already acknowledged this, um, but I'm making it as a separate bullet point, and I didn't use this phrase, but I'll use it in this moment, is we're recalibrating our expectations and that um, we are no longer going to be wounded by that which we're not receiving. And there's uh, a realization that, yes, that is painful, that we are not getting the kind of relationship that we've always wanted with a particular parent, family member, friend, significant other. But we're shifting, we're recalibrating our expectation to say, even though it's painful, it no longer needs to wound me. I no longer need to feel so emotionally dependent on having that work out and happen in my life, it's not gonna work out and happen. And I'm willing and I'm able to take a step back to recalibrate my expectation and to put this level of disappointment into a bit more of a perspective and say, I can still have other relationships in my life. I can still love life. I can still let in compassion for all of the hurt that we carry with, within us and for the duration of the number of years that I have left, or if we're talking about us universally, the number of years that we have left, we want to make these years the most connected and uh, um, um, relationship rich as possible. And it might not happen with our parent. It might not happen with um, the people that we originally thought it would. And that degree of disappointment need not wound us anymore. Now, what I have shared here today, I hope that you take these ideas and that some of them fit. And um, think of this as starting, launching a conversation. I mean, this, this is something that I have, comes up often with clients that I work with. And when, we, when we're really at that crossroads of needing to make a choice, it is so painful and can also really sort of rock your world because you're, you're, it's, like, it's like the world just opens up like, oh, wow, I, that's what we've been doing. That's why this relationship is so painful. So probably you're not going to come to a, a sense of completeness in this video and that it's something to visit and revisit. And I hope that it's an entry point into your self-directed healing work, but it, it's certainly not the full conversation. So this means that you might be asking yourself, what's next? How, how do we, you know, 
really answer the question, how do I continue to heal? And I've already mentioned, you know, those three bullet points, the profound grief work, the transform, uh, transfer from the parent child to, to adult to adult relating, and then also recalibrate the expectations. But in addition, I mean, all of my videos from the past and upcoming ones, they're all about this idea of like, well, how do we heal? And the truth is there is no quick fix answer. There's no sound bite to this question. Healing work is highly personal and it's unique to your needs. It requires education, discipline, and looking at your history. And also healing work takes time. I mean, this video is a long video. I mean, it takes time to really drop down into these ideas. We, we do not rush our healing work. There's a, there's a common saying uh, among psychotherapists trained in trauma work that says that um, slow is fast. When we're, really, we're, when we're working with trauma, we can choose to move slowly and it's gonna feel like we're moving quickly. So this means that healing work takes place when we slow down. Uh, the easiest way to answer the question, how do we heal, is by doing our healing work. So I like to think about these three things. Ask, ask yourself these three questions. Do you want to learn new relationship skills? Are you ready to educate yourself about attachment trauma? And can you make a daily commitment to this healing work? And I very much, yes, specifically said daily. This, this is something that requires attention. A good place to start and an approach uh, that I like to focus on with clients, there are three areas. It's your relationship to the past, your relationship to yourself, and your relationship to relating itself. So first, the relationship to the past. This means childhood, this means family, intergenerational trauma, inherited core beliefs. Now we take an inventory of where we came from. We identify the learned patterns and how these keep showing up in our relationships today. So we see the past playing out in the present. And when we say the past, we don't mean that it's stale and it's removed and it's something you know behind us. The past is very much active and alive in the present. We keep playing it out. Um, the next is your relationship to yourself. What this means, strengthening a sense of self, knowing your values, voicing your preferences, and pursuing your desires. We do this by enforcing our boundaries, which means you need to know what boundaries are. And then we take action. Uh, taking action means asserting agency. The, the what can I do, the ability to do, the ability to create change, the gas in the gas tank is the agency and we need to be able to put one foot in the other. It's not just a, a, a fancy idea. Healing work is not just something that we think about here. Hold on real quick. Excuse me. So also this is about knowing how to advocate for yourself. The relationship to yourself is one of self-advocacy. And when we advocate for ourselves, we are caring about ourselves, and that is strengthening and planting the seeds of self-love. The next component, the piece that I teach that is important is to really think about relating itself, the art of relating. What, are, what does that mean? How do we create relationships? We, how do people engage? How do we engage? How do we show up in present moment interactions and manage to communicate with intimacy and vulnerability and emotional openness. This is a skill and it's a somewhat meta, meta, you know, meta is thinking about thinking. So if we're talking about the art of relating, we're taking a step back and we're really looking at the mechanics. Well, how do people relate? How do people bond? And uh, that requires some effort. It's not, we don't just magically know how to do this. Uh, it requires some education and practice. And so relating to relating itself, the art of relating is a really important component of healing work. And uh, the way that we do this, a, a very foundational skill, is to lead with curiosity, to be curious about your own inner world process and curious about your relationships, but also curious about how others relate as well. 
So what I am talking about, everything I'm talking about in, in this video and up to this point about healing work is that we need a plan. And the model that I teach, and I said it earlier at the beginning of this video, is that of self-directed healing work. Now, self-directed healing work does not mean that you're by yourself doing it alone. This is not about isolation. It's important to be able to talk to others about your progress. We could still feel a sense of camaraderie, connection, and community, which is in fact the reason why I did create an online community called Improve Your Relationships. And we are a group of like-minded learners who realize we do not want to go it alone. Self-directed healing work means that we, at the, at the core of who we are, need to make choices of whoever's driving the bus. Well, we're driving the bus. And that we have to come tap into our inner wisdom to know how to make choices for our own growth and our own maturing. And yet we are bouncing ideas off of each other. We are exchanging skills with each other. We're offering encouragement to each other. We're also sharing the, the depths of the pain that this is hard work. So self-directed healing work is an orientation that we, co we collect the, uh, the resources that we need and we make some choices on how we apply those resources. But we very much still need to stay in community in order to do that. So that's why I created the membership community, Improve Your Relationships. It's a way uh, for us to have meaningful conversation and find support with each other. When we invest in our healing work and we change old relationship patterns, we're learning better skills of relating. And if this interests you, if you'd like to join us, you're welcome to join us. You can learn more uh, by checking out alanrobarge.com forward slash community. Make sure that you could see in the description, the, the URL will, will be there as well. Now keep in mind, if you value these videos, if you receive benefit, please consider becoming a sustaining supporter. You can make a donation, you can join the membership community, or you could also purchase one of my courses. Thank you in advance for the contribution. It not only acknowledges the hard work that it takes uh, to make free content, it also guarantees new videos for you in the future. Your contribution is one way to pay it forward. In closing, I want to uh, mention, I want to name why we do this work. Our attachment trauma keeps us disconnected in our relationships. And that often includes feeling disconnected from ourselves, which is very painful to live your life feeling disconnected from yourself. It, it sets us up to believe our relationships are gonna fail. The good news is that healing attachment trauma is possible. So please take from this video some encouragement and know there is hope <laughs> that in fact, as, as painful as all of this is, you know, we can, we, we're coming together to say, we talk about these things, we feel the feelings, we're doing our healing work, because actually we believe in the possibility of new, other, better, different, more securely attached type relationship. The truth is we all want to love and be loved and we all want meaningful relationships. So remember, we do this work because relationships are important and because emotional connections matter. Thank you for watching. There are more videos on the way. Now go out there and create loving relationships.